Dead Man is back. Well, almost back. Coming out on Friday, the 25th of August. Get that date in your calendars under three weeks away. And you've got to be ready because it is going to be incredible. We haven't had one in two years time. Been looking forward to this one for a while. So what is it? What's new? What's the same? Stick around. I'm going to ramble on for a while and just go through some of the new changes that come in, some of the old dev mode, some of the different mechanics in the game mode you might have forgotten about, or maybe this is your first time thinking about playing dev mode and you just want to know what's going on and what's all about it. Right. So firstly, this will be similar to the previous dev mode we had, which was Dead Man Mode Reborn, in the sense that they are giving us sigils again. You might remember these uh, being extremely strong and overpowered. Solo mission, one hit in a bunch of people with a stack of aggression sigil and rampage sigil and stuff like that. So we'll have to see how they work out. They've not released too many details on the sigils. We'll see what's going on with them. Right, I've got a few things listed out I want to remember to talk about, but I'm probably going to end up jumping all over the place when I get into it. Main thing I do want to speak about will be the breaches they're introducing, the combat bracket worlds and quests you get with them, the point system and prize pool this time round, and something else I've not heard too many people talk about, which is the fact that it's been two years since we've had dev mode. So there is so much new content in the game that's going to have a big impact on dev mode as a whole. and shifts in the meta with these new items and such. Right. Let's start with breaches. This is what I've been wanting for a long while and I'm so excited for it. Breaches, big world events that are going to create a hotspot of activity, forcing players to stop training at the hidden locations and come together to fight. Because if you don't do this, you're going to be missing out on some incredible reward. rewards. How do I speak? Um, if you've never experienced the joys of multi-fighting, you are truly missing about. I can't speak missing out. Yes, people will cry about clamor mode and whatnot, but at the end of the day, it's an MMORPG. Multiplayer content is what it's all about. And yes, there's a singles version of this for those of you who don't want to participate in multi. But in previous dev mode, some of my best memories are the big multi fights that took part such as the Shiloh village lockdown big lunar isle fights and last of mode it was fights around corporal beast in the past you'd lose xp on death or one of your lives you died however from reading through all the blogs this time around sounds like there's no xp loss punishment for dying scold so it's going to make multi fights even more active, no need to be scared about skilling up anymore. You're not going to lose all your experience you've worked for. So it should be fun to go around and see that. Right. What are breaches? Basically, around RuneScape, there is going to be areas where bosses are going to spawn at certain times. And if you kill these, it'll give you the most powerful items, the jewels and supply drops. You can't quite picture what I'm talking about. Imagine a pest control portal spawns out monsters. However, instead of this being a pest control, it's in Camelot. And instead of it spawning low-level monsters out of it, it's now spawning the Dagonoff Kings, King Black Dragon, God Wars Dungeon bosses. And for those of you not in a clan, or enjoy more solo content, don't worry, there's going to be two versions of breaches that spawn. One version is going to be in the multi-combat area, and the other version will be in a single combat area. Um, I'm assuming in a single combat area, the breaches will work sort of the same way the Rev boss works, where anyone can attack the boss, but you can still be attacked by another player at the same time. So this is going to be like hot spots for single PKs fighting each other under PVMers or trying to kill the bosses. It should make for some very entertaining content to participate in as well as just for watching if you don't play demo mode yourself. There will be plenty of people to watch take part in these. 
these bosses are most likely going to have higher hit points than usual and be designed for big groups to fight it. They've said they want they they don't want to they want to let you know announce the locations that they're going to be spawned in, just so that everyone knows. Right, breaches are happening now. Need to get there. Need to kill the bosses. This is where the loot's at, and just go for it. It should be incredibly fun. Breaches will be the best place and possibly the only place to get some of the high tier sigils. Now we st we still don't know what these sigils are going to be. Uh, going to be, so I'll go into that a little bit more later. The other things that these breaches are going to give us are be the only places to get blighted weapons such as blighted twisted bow, blighted scythe, void waker, AGS, tomb can shadow, as well as being dropped best droppers of tier five emblems, global supply drop table, and most importantly, now it will be the only place to get PvP weapons. So these are your Vesta Longsword, Vesta Spear, Morrigan's Javelins, Morrigan Axes, and the Zerial Staff. Originally, these were available in the wilderness with like higher combat level monsters and bosses having the best chance to drop them. Then uh, one of the previous demo modes, they started releasing these to the global drop table so that any monster have a really rare chance of dropping these. And now it's been changed again so that these weapons will only be coming from breaches. So if you want a Vesta Longsword, you're gonna have to go kill the monster of the breaches to get it. Um, the breaches will not be active at all time, and we don't quite know if this is a thing that's gonna be once a day or multiple times per day. I'm kind of thinking it's gonna be happening once a day or twice a day per world. However, there's a lot of different time zones, so I'm thinking it's going to be split up. So you'll have UK worlds spawning a breach at, say, 4 p.m. And then only the UK worlds will have this breach spawning at this time. And then a few hours later, it might be right. Now it's time for the US worlds to have a breach spawning at a better time for them. A few hours later after that, Australian worlds now have a breach spawning at that, that time. So. It's just going to create a lot of activity across the world at different times, which will be hopefully suited for people in those time zones so they can experience it, enjoy it. And for all you sweaty people like me, you're going to be playing throughout the day, random time zones. We're just going to hop worlds when these breaches spawn. Be on bad ping, but just fight it out. Kill these bosses, get this loot. And. One other thing that doing breaches will do is going to be the best way to earn points. You might think, what's points? Why is this important? Well, this time around, they are adding a point system to the mode. It is going to be similar to the one they had in Fresh Start Worlds, and none of you probably played Fresh Start Worlds, so let's explain what that was. Basically, Every time you kill a boss, complete a combat task, complete a quest, get a 99, do some raids, you earn points. These points are going to be important this dev mode because there is $20,000 to be won for people who have earned points. And earning more points, you can have a better chance of winning some of this money. This money isn't just going to the person with the top points. It's going to be split up into 20 different $1,000 prizes for people who have participated in the game. How will this be distributed? Well, there's going to be a tier system based on the points you earn. Like what they've done in leagues before, where players in the top 1% of points will be Dragon tier, top 5%, Rune tier, top 10%, Addy tier, and so onwards. And then they will be distributing these prizes as follows to like people in the top tiers. So five people in the top 25 will receive $1,000. So if you're in the top 25 of players, you've got a one in five chance of winning $1,000 this time around. No need to fight people off in a 1v1 at the end if you're bad at PvP. If you can just do some PVM and get these points, one in five chance of winning $1,000. I 
don't know if I'm going to have enough time to play and like go for that, but it would be fun to see if I can do that because everyone likes money at the end of the day. Right, so the rest of the prize is if you get into the top 1%, so if you get into Dragon Tier, seven people will receive $1,000. Five people in Rune Tier or above will get $1,000, and three people in Addy Tier will get $1,000. So you might not be able to PK, but if you're good at PVM, you could win a lot of money here. $1,000 would not mind winning that. Right, how it is compared to previous demo modes. So previously, we had a $32,000 prize pool, which was split up into $20,000 for the person who won $10,000 to the person second, and third and fourth would each get $1,000. So $32,000 split up like that. Which basically means only the top PKer ever really had a chance of winning that money. I mean, I participated in 10 plus 10 modes, and the highest ever got was rank 16, and that's probably a bit of luck. So I realistically never had a chance to win that. But now I do. And now you might be watching and thinking, well, I don't like PKing. But I, could, I could win some money from this, and that's quite exciting. Um, last, last time around when you had the 1v1s, it always just led to lag, DDoS in, when it registers, you know, cheat client users. But that shouldn't be happening this time around because most of the prize, it's not going to be like a... Right, you've got to participate in this final hour to win the prize. No, you've played throughout the entire season tournament. You've got a chance. I, I kind, I kind of like it. I, prob I wasn't going to win the one v ones. I'm probably not going to win this way. But we'll see. Overall, I just love demo mode. The risk reward aspects of just playing the game like it. So I'm just looking forward to it being back and having that thrill. There's, there's something about going to do a Slayer task and knowing that at any moment someone can come along and just start attacking you, start killing you. I mean, loads of people have played... I say loads of people. People love to watch high-risk, high-reward content, like your PvP hard crime, and that is very entertaining because you know at some point someone can just be around the corner waiting to kill you, and Debma mode is kind of like that with that feeling you get the adrenaline if someone's on you and you're risking a lot of money or whatnot. Risking all your gear, stuff in your bank. Um, doing a little bit of maths to see what the odds are, what the odds are of actually winning money. So, assuming 20,000, just random here, 20,000 people log into dev mode, that would make the top 1% of players, there'd be 200 players in the top 1%. So if you are one of these people and getting that tier, the dragon tier, that is a 7 out of 200 chance or a 3.5% chance to win $1,000. That's not too bad. I mean, if you're in rune, it's going to be, there's going to be more people, like five times the people in rune, so it's less chance than Addy, even less chance than that. But it's not too bad. And the point system is good for one of the reasons that it's going to encourage people to keep playing the game mode for the entire time, hopefully, and like keep the activity of dev mode up. Like previously, when people are just grinding out gear for the 1v1s, with the boosted experience rates, boosted drop rates, you can quite often sort of complete everything you want to do in the first week, and then it's two weeks of, I don't even want to log in and play now because I don't want to risk losing my items I've got, I'm just waiting for this final to fight. Whereas now it's like, right, I've got to keep playing, I've got to keep earning these points to try and win the prize. And one other incredible thing this time round, items and stats will transfer over to World 45 Dead Man at the end of it. So if you go ahead and max your account during this demo mode, you'll have a max account for World 45. If you earn yourself 
Load of Ancestral Sets, Dragon Claws, Void Waker. Oh, all of these items, they're going to transfer over to World 45. It's going to keep items having a high value, as well as just be a way for people who haven't played demo mode before or wanted to get into playing and play on World 45. An actual starting chance. And that should boost activity on World 45, as well as keep prices of items high on this dev mode throughout the whole thing. So maybe you don't care about dev mode, but you want some 07 GP. Last time around, we had items such as Dragon Claws swapping for 1 billion GP in like the first few days. Because people want to PK with these items because it's strong, it's fun, they can make videos out of it. And this time round, these items are going to keep a high value because they're going to not be deleted at the end of it. All this stuff will be transferred over to World 45. So if you just want to PVM and make some money, this might be the best I I'm not even going to say might, this will be the best money making method in RuneScape. Playing dev mode, you can make thousands and thousands and it's going to be easier to PVM because you've got sigils buffing you up, combat sigils and such. And then you've got the drop rate on top of that being four times more common to get loot. Ah, oh, it's going to be incredible. But I have just gone completely off. What was the next thing I wanted to talk about? Uh, let's check my list. I'm just jumping all over the place, like I said I would. Much of a ramble. Okay. So, what after point system? Let's go into combat bracket world. Right. Start with, I was very apprehensive about the combat bracket worlds. I was not a fan of them in the last Devon mode, where we had brackets from level 3 to level 70. Level, was it even that? I think it was this. I think it was level 3 to level 70. Level 71 to 100, and 101 to 126. Three bracket worlds. I didn't like it because it felt like people were too spread out. I spent a lot of my time at the higher combat bracket world, and it just didn't feel dangerous anymore because 90% of the PKers stayed in the combat bracket below this. They stayed in the 100 combat bracket world just so they could like bully all the other people. The majority of players were in that bracket so that that's where all the activity was. I was off doing Slayer. Feeling like I'm playing a safe game mode, whereas I like the risk act aspect of dev mode where people are going to be attacking you at any time and you need to prepare. Whereas there's no one there. BK me. It's just like playing regular RuneScape with XP boost. This time around, they are introducing five different combat bracket worlds. Level 3 to 50, 51 to 70, 71 to 90, 91 to 110, and 111 to 126. So, this just means there's going to be so many different people spread out across all of the worlds. It's going to feel somewhat like a ghost town if they don't do it correctly. Um, as there is this many worlds, they need to be fast at decreasing the worlds. If, if population drops, they need to get rid of worlds quickly so that it pushes everyone together so it's not just so spread out of the population. Like, there's no point having five worlds for a combat bracket that only has 500 people playing it. Push all 500 people into one single world. Two, two, say, say two worlds if you're worried about having bad ping on one of them. Just so that it feels more active. People around, there's a risk, act, risk, risk aspect there. And what they are proposing to do with these does make me hopeful that they're gonna do it right and they'll keep activity. So 
one of the things that they're doing to uh, encourage players to level up combat and to get into different combat brackets is to have a different drop rate multiplier per world. So on the lowest world, one times drop rate. 5170, 1.75 times drop rate. 71 to 90, 2.5 times drop rate. 91 to 110, 3.25 times drop rate. And the max bracket, four times drop rate. This should encourage people who want to be earning the items, sell to trade off, or just get for themselves, to push themselves to this higher combat bracket world. And it should at least have more activity on the highest world where people are going to be grinding out PVM. PKs will go try and fight these people. More PKs will fight them, and it should push people together into this higher bracket. Hopefully, especially with the breaches come around. Breaches are also going to spawn more monsters in the higher bracket. So if you are trying to earn points, higher combat bracket is going to be the way to go. Uh, have your best chance of getting extra points from these breaches with the more monsters. Um, what else about these brackets? Higher tier sigils will be more likely to drop in the higher combat bracket. So these might be, uh, I don't know if they'll bring it back with the Guardian Angel sigils, which protects your bank on death, which was from last time. People seem to enjoy that one and just rampages, yeah, sigil of aggression. Hopefully, only dropping these really powerful sigils in the top world pushes players to go there, level up their combat, and it's just going to be more enjoyable to fight around. They've also said they could restrict some different content in the lower bracket world, but I think... <clears throat> I don't know if they'll need to restrict anything if they're just... Drop rate change should hopefully... Hopefully be enough for that. Another thing about these combat bracket worlds, they have said that you're going to get different quest unlocks are progressing into each bracket so at the lower bracket you'll get a few basic quests unlocked going up to next bracket maybe get desert treasure completed next bracket monkey madness 2 completed next bracket song of the elves completed and dragon slayer 2 and all that <clears throat> they have that was what they put in for their initial proposal i think they've received a lot of feedback and a bit of people don't necessarily want some people don't necessarily want all the OP quests to be unlocked straight away just for getting combat levels. So it sounds like they're going to do a proposal where they give you some basic quest unlocks each combat bracket and then also identify a few, in their words, pinnacle quests for each bracket. For example, once you hit the 111 combat bracket, you might be able to unlock one of these quests and choose your pick whether it be Monkey Madness 2, or Sins of the Father, or Dragon Slayer 2, maybe even Song of the Elves there, but means that you still have to do some questing if you want to, and it also means that you can't just get 71 combat and just start farming the gauntlet, because that seemed like it was going to be one of the most broken money-making methods in the game, of how safe it is to do in full instance, and just be farming out GP from like a few hours in, so I'm glad they've scrapped the ability to just give everyone a lot of free quests. I'm st I'm still thankful for giving people quests. Not everyone likes doing quests, so giving people some basic quests to do is a good thing. But it is still more beneficial to do quite a lot of these quests yourself because there will be a ten times XP multiplier. That works on your quest rewards as well. So if you go ahead and do, say, Monkey Man, this is a big one you do for XP, where you get 35,000 XP in two skills and then 20,000 XP in two other skills, times that by 10, do Monkey Man, you're now getting 350,000 XP in, say, attack and defense or strength and hit points. And I like that it's worthwhile to do quests because they've given this XP boost. So you might not want to do it, you might want to take longer, but for people like me who like to strategize and 
plan out everything that you're going to be doing in this game mode, being able to still do the quest yourself and work out, okay, is it worth doing this quest or is it worth just doing training? Especially with some of the skilling quests as well. So say, if I want to do dig site, that's what, 14,000 mine XP, something like that? Do the quest on dev mode, 140,000 mine XP. Be what, level 1 to level 53 or somewhat? Like, it will be very worthwhile to do it. And I like that you get this XP boost for doing quests because it creates more of a hotspot that people might think, okay, these quests are worthwhile doing. So I'm going to quest it myself rather than just unlocking it. PKs can then go to these locations to look for people doing quests. Other PKs can go to these locations to look for the PKs that are looking for people doing the quest, and they're just more activity, keep it dangerous game mode, and that's one of the enjoyable things I'm looking forward to. But yeah, Combat Bracket Worlds, overall, should be all right as long as it's done well. And I'm hoping that the changes they put in there is going to force people to want to level up to the higher combat bracket. I mean, if you, if you want to be competing for points, you are going to want to have higher stats to fight these bosses, to grind out these bosses, and to get all of the skills, and you're going to be earning XP while doing that. So hopefully, hopefully, these higher, higher level worlds feel really active. Right, quick talk about sigils then. We do not know what these sigils are going to do. What we have been told is that there's not going to be sigils this time around to boost your skilling XP rates anymore or any, any further because they don't want to mess up um, when you transfer over to World 45. So stuff like production master type sigil where you smith every bar in one click or make every, cook every food in one tick that's probably going to be gone instead i'm expecting to see sigils for skilling that are just flat up buff your resources that you get so maybe you get two times fish you catch two times logs or even more than that i expect to still see sigils that bank all your stuff so i can just AFK chop a tree or the logs go into my bank. Um, minor rock, it all goes into the bank. What else? I think there's going to be, it sounds like it's a big focus on EVM for these points this time around. So a lot of sigils to maybe help you out doing PVM is what I could see happening. Be it the extra damage boost or extra accuracy when fighting monsters. But you can also now have three combat sigils active at once. Previously, it was only two. Now you can activate three at once. So I'm very curious to see how they go about all of these, um, like the balancing around these sigils. Because before we had situations where people were getting one shot from just doing one shot from 100 hit points by using sigils together, and they had to go ahead and nerf the power of a lot of these sigils like a weekend and if they're not telling us until the day or until we figure it out ourselves what these sigils do are they going to get the bouncing right we've just got to hope that yes they are i mean they've now got mank working there working on dev mode he has a lot of experience in pvp so hopefully he can help out and think correctly about the power that these sigils have think of the niche use that they have because last time around, the sigils that they made, one of them they made, which main example of like what I'll call a broken sigil, was the sigil they used to try and like help you escape. So you had a sigil that when used would just completely get rid of your freeze. So if you're frozen, click the sigil, no longer frozen, can run away. They were like, okay, this is, this is a good defensive sigil that people are going to be able to use to escape from PKers. In reality, it turned out that 
People trying to get away from PKs weren't using this. The PKs themselves were using this to make sure people can't get away. So if you want to get away from a PK and you're like, okay, I managed to freeze them back. I can hug a tree, hug a wall, teleport away. Oh no, the PK is just unfrozen himself on the one chance I've got, so I can't escape. So situations like that worry me slightly, but I'm hoping, I'm hoping they now balance it and can sort out these sigils with. They've got a lot of J mods on the team now. Hopefully, if you have them participate in PKing and got a good idea of how how to balance these. <clears throat> um, I am interested to see this time around what kind of defensive sigils they go for. Are they going to make it like combat sigils, so you can only use like a attacking sigils at once or defensive sigils at once, or that you do whatever utility sigils? I'm really hoping they're keeping the ones I had before. They had like unlimited stamina. You run forever having the sigil on, which is good. You had your last recall teleport back to the location you were just at. Stuff like that that just makes the gameplay more enjoyable and fun is really good with stuff like that. Having teleports back to places you, you, you wouldn't usually be able to go to. I remember using the last recall to just teleport instantly back to the Monkey Madness 2 burst and chin and caves and just <laughs> use that the whole time. Anyway, we... Ah, that's what I was going to say. We are not going to know the sigils potentially until the day of release, until we're actually playing the game. I am really, really hoping that they do not release on the wiki all these sigils and what they do. I want people to, I want there to be like hype behind it where I'm the first person to get into this higher combat record world. I'm the first person to receive this sigil. Oh my God, what does it do? Let's check it out rather than just log into the game mode, okay, load up wiki, let's read through every sigil that does this, 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 and this, and decide, okay, these are the ones that I want to be getting. I mean, it's going to be hard to keep secret all these sigils, what they do, because as soon as you get into the game, you can go along to the Grand Exchange and type in sigil of the, and then it will come up with all of the sigils, all the names, and from the names, you can usually gather what's going to be happening or what it's going to do. So we'll see, we'll see how they can hide it, but the hype behind someone just going along and getting a drop that, oh my God, I don't know what that is, what it's going to actually do. It's really cool, really fun. And it's, you, don't, you don't see it in RuneScape nowadays with the like hidden drops because everything goes for a poll. Everything gets voted on. We know exactly what's going to happen before it even comes into the game. And... Having a game mode that's temporary where they can just chuck in stuff like this should be fun. I mean, with the global drop table as well, it's going to be fun to see why I'm so put on that. I feel like it's going to be more, more alkable rewards this time around. We'll kind of see what's going to happen about that one. One of the last things I want to go through is something that might, you might not have put too much thought into, but it's one of the things that I think is going to switch up and change their mode a lot. That is all of the updates that have happened to the game since we last had dev mode. So previously, we used to have a dev mode every sort of three months. You have them four times a year. So there wouldn't be this period of, oh, this many new items are coming to the game and we're now using them on dev mode because you'd, you'd be playing it the whole time and it wouldn't be too much happening. The fact we haven't had dev mode in two years there is so many updates that have happened that are going to affect dev mode. So let me just go for a few of the updates we've had. Um, Asani Night Asani's Nightmare. Uh, Guardians of the Rift, that might have an update with the Runecraft in. Giant Foundry, Beneath Curse Sands, and Tombs of a Mascot. That is a big one. We've also had Nex release. So you got your Torva that can come into the game now, Ancient God Sword, Zarek Crossbow and Van Braces. We also had the Wilderness Boss rework, Void Waker in the game, Secrets of the North, Phantom Muspa, so you got your Venator Bow, your Saturated Imbued Heart, and your Extra Potions, your Men Fight Remedies that are going to be good for people brewing a lot. And What's recently released? Desert Treasure 2. 
Right, let me go through things one at a time. So we'll go we'll go uh James Bond Massacre, because that that is a big one. That's the one that's got the most the mo the most like new items. So you've got your Missouri, you've got your Light Bearer, you've got your Fang, you've got your Tumican Shadow, your Ward. Everything you get from there? I think it is, but yeah. The big things from this Light Bearer. This is an incredibly strong item and it is so common. And you add the fact that you're playing dev mode, you can have four times drop rates. This is going to be an item that all PKs want. Previously, you're in a bank fight with someone, use your two special attacks, and then it's okay, I can't kill you anymore, let's wait five minutes and try again. With the light bearer, you double your spec regen. So now every two and a half minutes, you can dump your full spec on someone, have a chance to kill them. That is going to be incredibly strong, especially when you pair it with stuff like BLS that has a 25% spec rate. And then you've got sigils on top of that last time that even reduced, reduced special attacks by 10%. So your VLS was now 15% special used. Your Armadil Godsword was 40%. Your Gmall was 40%. Stuff like that. Like, you're going to be able to do so many special attack and just bank fighting or being caught by PKs anywhere in the game is going to be so dangerous and a lot of people are going to be dying left right. I mean it came to a point last time in dev mode where because of the sigils PKs were dying a lot to each other because of the power of them and everyone started to down gear so everyone was banking the ancestral sets, the armadillo sets. They were coming back out into the barrel barrow sets. Sorry, I've got an itchy nose. Uh, barrow sets. You got your arams and carols was being the main thing used because people were just dying and they didn't want to risk all this high high gear. I mean, people will still use it, but it's gonna be deadly. On top of that, you've got Missouri now, so you got your damage boosting range armor going to be very strong and although you can just use the base base armor, i don't know how good it is it's sort of 30 percent 30 defense armor the like, base set i don't know if that's going to be worth using or if you're going to need a fortified version or people actually want to start running with it we'll see people might just want the damage boost people might not want to fight pks so happy to use the base version another thing is the Bang, Osmumpton's Bang, the strongest weapon in the game, good at so many different bosses. That on Debra mode, where it's now EVM focused and you're going to be grinding boss out the whole time, it's going to be so useful at loads of places, Bandos and whatnot. Wait, last Debra mode, we, we did, we did have, we did have both. Okay, that's been out for a while. Okay, um, just thinking in my head, but. What else we got? Wieldy boss rework introducing the most powerful weapon in the game, arguably the Void Waker. You add the Void Waker on top of using aggression or rampage or sigils that boost your damage. You're going to be able to spec 70s, 80s, 90s, and you're going to have trouble to pray against it. That is going to be so strong, and I am fearing it, fearing it already. It's, it's bad enough in the main game, like 50% spec, 4-tick weapon, easily kill you. And now you add on sigils on top of that, that is going to be a very, very scary weapon. But I do, I do really want to just go around. You know how I used to go around DDS rushing people? Imagine logging in under someone, just void wake a spec them twice. It always hits and you have gonna have a great chance just like to two hit someone <laughs> be so fun especially if you're not even doing that you could just avoid wake a spec and then ags them or something like that and uh, it's gonna be so powerful but so fun and i'm really looking forward to it right so phantom musper ben Shaboa said not really much for pkang use but it does oh something else i've forgotten about it's got the ancient icon from that. So you have an ancient 
upgrade to the Ancient Scepter, or Ancient Staff to Ancient Scepter, which gives you a longer freeze timer. You add that in to your Dragon Slayer tier rewards with the extra gems that buff your spells more. The new Scepter, I'm thinking with the Blood one that you can now Blood Barrage with more percent and you can overheal your hit points. That's going to be very, very useful in these multi fights at the breaches. Keep yourself alive to extra damage. Kind of like a cheap weapon. I'm assuming hopefully you can parch it by then or keep it on death. And that's going to be a good choice of weapon for all these multi battles. Desert Treasure 2. Soul Reaper Axe. Is it going to be used much more? Not really for more than just farming bosses, I'd guess. The new rings would be useful, but again, Light Bearer is just so strong that new rings don't really matter too much. Virtus Armor, however, will be arguably the best, the best armor in the game for PKers, having that extra damage boost on Ancients, being able to barrage 45s as it is, and then add in sigils with extra damage or accuracy on top of that. Oh, it is going to be scary. We will see how that goes. That is one. That is one I'm not looking forward to too much. But I suppose it does have its drawbacks and it's not that high mage defense. So maybe people will still want to use Ancestral instead of it. And that might be the way. I mean, PVMers might want Ancestral with their shadows. Where they're going to be farming bosses all day and farming raids. And we'll have to see how it goes. Um, another thing, I'm not sure it was updated last time, but I will mention it in case it wasn't. They have changed skull mechanics in RuneScape at some point over the last few years. You can no longer lose a skull while in combat. And for Debma mode, this is quite, this is quite, um, uh, important thing to note because Previously, if you're scold and in combat, you just be like, okay, I'll tank out my skull. Once it runs out, we can just go into a safe zone and escape. You can't do that anymore. You will never lose your skull because of how it works being in combat. You have to actually freeze escape or use a different escape route. I used to like grappling, grapple up. Myth grapple to escape because no one ever had that on them and stuff like that. And just planning out escapes in different areas was something I found really fun. But yeah, you're not going to be able to lose your skull. You're going to be stuck on that 30 second timer forever. So either have enough supplies in your bank to tank it all, be able to just get the freeze and escape people, or figure out a different escape for each area. And I think that. Pretty much covers everything I wanted to go over in this video. It's going to be a long, long old ramble video. So any of you have listened to it all the way through, cheers. I'm interested to know your thoughts on demo mode, what things you want, would have liked to have seen, any of the things you really don't like or do like. And... Overall, I'm expecting there to be a new Deadman Blow blog in the next couple of weeks that goes over the exact list of quests that we're going to get, a few other changes that they're going to make. Um, I know they've had, they've wanted to put one out, but we'll just see when it actually turns and look forward to reading through all of that. But I am just so excited for it. I can't wait. I. I'm going to try this time around, first time ever, to actually make like demo mode progress videos and just fun stuff that's happened on demo mode and we'll see how that goes. That might be absolutely terrible. I might just get lost in the grind with demo mode and not end up doing anything, but I'm going to give it a go this time around. So do subscribe if you do want to see that. You want to see me running at some Caffabee Fishers and specking them out. Yes, watching.